Let's pray as we stand. Father, as we've sung, please open up your word to us and use it to occupy our hearts more fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> Ask a Christian what they value about being a Christian, and I guess pretty soon they will talk about forgiveness. I value knowing that through Jesus' death, God has forgiven me everything I need forgiving for and will continue to do so for the rest of my life. Uh, only value is a bit lame, isn't it? It blows my mind that God has forgiven me, is what we should be saying. But what's the point of forgiveness? Is it just that I'm forgiven? Conscience clear? Well, there is that, but the point of God's forgiveness is to give us a fresh start in relating to him, in putting him first in our lives. And those who are not yet Christians often see that, in my experience, better than some of us who are. So people in Christianity Explored groups with me have often said what has put them off is professing Christians who go on about God's forgiveness and yet who appear to live uh, unchanged in their sin. And those not yet Christians have instinctively known that that is not right, but that the point of being forgiven our sin is that we turn from our sin to putting God first, as we should, albeit imperfectly. That is what last week's chapter of our Nehemiah series and this week's chapter are all about. They are about the life we're forgiven for. That's what we're looking at this morning, the life we are forgiven for. So would you turn in the Bibles to page 405, and thank you to my sister for uh, picking mine up, having chucked it off the, uh, off the pulpit earlier. Uh, page 405 will get you to Nehemiah chapter 9, where we were last week. Nehemiah chapter 9, we're just going to revisit chapter 9, verse 30. So God's Old Testament people, Israel, were looking back on what had happened to them. And chapter 9, verse 30, they prayed to God, for many years you bore with them, the past generations of Israel, and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. In other words, allowed Israel to be invaded and exiled. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. And the present generation was evidence of that, because God had allowed them to return to their land to rebuild the capital Jerusalem and his temple in it and to have a fresh start. But remember, the point of God's forgiveness is to give us a fresh start in relating to him in putting him first, in repentance, as Ramsey put it last week. And that is what they commit themselves to in this week's passage. So turn over the page, if you would, to chapter 9 and verse 38. Chapter 9 and verse 38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant, in other words, commitment, in writing... On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Chapter 10 then kicks off with a list of all the leaders who put their names to this commitment, starting with Nehemiah, and then skip down, as we did in the reading, to verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to do what? To walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our Lord and his rules and his statutes. And just clock that key phrase in verse 28. We're talking about all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God. So they were back in what had been their land. It was no longer solely theirs. It was occupied by the peoples of the lands, as this passage calls them. 
So like us, they were now living cheek by jowl with people of completely different beliefs and ideologies and lifestyles. And so that they could not literally separate themselves off from these people any more than we can or should today. So look again at what verse 28 is talking about. It's separation from the peoples of the land to what? The law of God. So this is talking about separation of who you take your cue from, who you follow. And God's people are to take their cue from, from God's will revealed in God's word, not from the beliefs and ideologies and, and uh, lifestyles of those around them. I know our fear is then that if, if we're too different, we won't be able to be a witness to them. The Bible is always coming back at us with the truth that only if we are different, by taking our cue from God, will we, will we be any kind of witness to him at all. You are the salt of the earth, says Jesus, but what if the salt loses its saltiness? What then? So what Nehemiah and co. committed to was obedience to God as revealed in his Old Testament law. We live, we live this side of the cross and resurrection, and what we commit to is obedience to Jesus as Lord. Now that includes learning from the New Testament what in the Old Testament is still his will for us today. That is a big issue that I'm not going to unpack now. Instead, we're going to look at these three areas of God's Old Testament law that Nehemiah and co. particularly committed to, which they did because these areas had been particular areas of failure for them. So here's the first thing they committed to. Nehemiah and co. said, we will only seek marriages which encourages us to put the Lord first. Look down to verse 30. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now remember, this flows from chapter 8, where Ezra reintroduced them to God's law, which they'd neglected. And that includes Deuteronomy 7, verse 3, where God says this, You shall not intermarry with non-Israelite people, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Why not? For... They would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. So the issue was not purity of race, but purity of faith. And Israel wasn't a single racial group anyway. You only have to think of someone like Ruth, who was from Moab, who joined Israel and then married an Israelite. So the issue was not purity of race, but purity of faith, of unmixed commitment to the Lord. And one thing that had most pulled Israel away from commitment to the Lord down the years had been marriages to those who worshipped other gods. Because those of us who are married know that marriage is where you let another person get closer to you than anyone else. And therefore, you give them the opportunity to influence you like nobody else. So if they are pulling in a different direction spiritually... That may be the biggest pull on you away from commitment to the Lord. And one obvious pitfall in that situation is that you water down or even change what you believe to make it easier to live with a spouse who doesn't agree with your beliefs or even opposes your beliefs. And of course, that goes for other close relationships that influence us deeply. So, for example, parents often change their minds on what the Bible says about marriage and sexuality because of the beliefs of their children and the choices of their children. So that's why Nehemiah and co. made this commitment. We will only seek marriages which encourage us to put the Lord first. For them then, that meant marrying a fellow Israelite. The principle comes through to us in the New Testament now in verses like 1 Corinthians 7 39 up on the screen a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives but if her husband dies she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the lord in other words only to a fellow believer in jesus 
Now, I know for the singles here, that can seem just to increase the problems for Christians who want to marry, especially for Christian women, uh, who in most contexts outnumber the Christian men, although our church survey shows we're pretty much 50-50. But we need to back off and, and ask, what is the number one thing in life? Is the number one thing in life getting married? Is the number one thing in life having children? No, no, no. And I apologize to singles if our church life ever suggests that we think it is. The number one thing in life is to be in relationship with the Lord and to live the whole of life, whether you're single or married, that's a secondary detail for him. So if we're thinking clearly, we should want a marriage where we and our spouse are pulling in the same direction of serving Jesus as Lord. That's what the Lord wants for you if you're still single. And that's the kindness and wisdom behind 1 Corinthians 7, 39. So what if you are a Christian married to someone who is not? First of all, I want to say to those of you who are not Christians, but who come along at least from time to time with a Christian husband or wife, that I really respect you for doing that, that you are really welcome. And that I realize you may be doing a very great deal to accommodate and encourage the faith of your husband or wife, for example, by being here right now rather than in the garden or whatever else you'd be doing. And I want to say if at least privately you're open to sharing their belief, if you could only come to believe it, my hope is that your contact with this church family will help you to process these things for yourself, which is pretty much impossible to do within the intensity of talking to your spouse, most people would say. But then what if you're the Christian married to someone who is not? The first thing to say is that is where you are under God's sovereignty. And so that is where now God means you to be. Living for him in that marriage, in that family. Not least with the prayerful hope of pointing your spouse and your children to Jesus by the way that you live. Second thing to say is that how you got there under God's sovereignty maybe one of many stories. Maybe you were both not Christians when you married and since then you've become a Christian. Maybe you both professed faith when you were married and since then one of you said, I, I just don't, just can't believe this anymore. Maybe you got married before you'd ever heard this part of the Bible's teaching, in which cases you are not responsible for choosing your way into the situation. But some of us may be. Maybe we did know this, and we went knowingly against it. In which case, under God's sovereignty, again, you are still where he means you to be, living for him in that marriage, in that family. But if you've not done so already, you do need to acknowledge responsibility to yourself and to God for a wrong step taken along the way. And one person I know in our church family who was in that situation said, she really only got going again spiritually when she did acknowledge that and was able to move on again, forgiven and, and clear with the Lord. So that's the first thing Nehemiah and Co. said and that Christians should be saying today, we will only seek marriages which encourage us to put the Lord first. Here's the second thing they were saying. We will live as people who belong to the Lord first. Look on to verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sale, sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. So remember, this flows from chapter 8 where Ezra re reintroduced God's law to them. That includes the Ten Commandments, of which number four says this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall, do no, you, shall do, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now you may know those verses, but what about these from Exodus 31? 
And the Lord said to Moses, you're to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. In other words, I set you apart from other people to belong to me, to serve me, and to witness to me. So that's saying one sign that Israel belonged to the Lord was to be that they kept the Sabbath. So now look back to Nehemiah 9, verse 31. That's why they say, and if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy. So the peoples of the land did not do Sabbath. They were seven-day-a-week workers and buyers and sellers. And that was a sign that they belonged only to the world of work and money and what money can buy. So the world of 70-hour weeks and Ikea and good food magazine and gorgeous houses and flash cars and hectic-paced leisure and foreign holidays and luxurious retirements and all the rest, because they thought that was ultimate reality, materialism, if you like the jargon. This life is all there is, so get as much stuff as you can and have as many experiences as you can before you snuff it. Carpe diem, because the diem is very short. And Karl Marx would have loved them because they just saw themselves as, quote, economic units. I heard someone on the radio, radio the other day talking about education and describing children like that. We've got to prepare the future economic units, he said. And that's how Marxism sees human beings. And yet the classic thing you hear from people who live like that is what? There must be more to life than this. How many times have you read that in the biography of a celebrity or a, a lottery winner? And in the Sabbath commandment, God called his people for one day in seven to, to step out of that world of work and money and what money can buy as a sign that, yes, there is more to life, as a sign that they didn't belong only or even firstly to that world, and as a sign that that is not where they were to find their identity. Whereas in our culture, that world pretty much defines you, doesn't it? Which is why the question's, what do you do? Or where do you live? Or what do you drive? Or how much do you earn? Are so, so important to people. But in the Sabbath commandment, God called his people for one day out of seven to step out of all that, to be reminded that their ultimate relationship with, is with him, to be strengthened in that ultimate relationship by doing what we're doing now, meeting with God's people around God's word, and to be reminded that our ultimate identity here this morning is not engineer or teacher or doctor or stay-at-home mum or retired or unemployed. It's human being made in the image of God, and if you're trusting in Jesus, child of God on top of that. And that is still part of the wisdom of taking one day off in seven from our normal work and treating it as different and using it differently for the Lord. It's still a sign to us, let alone to others, of who we belong to first. Here's the third thing Nehemiah and co. committed to. They said, we will value God's temple enough to put its financial support first. Look on to verse 32. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. That's the temple. And that was to cover what we in our giving review each year would call ministry costs, heating, lighting, etc., etc. Those are listed down to verse 34. And then verse 35 onwards is about what we, we, we would call in our giving review staff costs. <clears throat> so verse 35, we bind ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord, also to bring to the house of our God to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, I hasten to add they got the sons back, um, <clears throat> as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil, to the priests." So God called them to offer the first of their crops and their animal young and so on and so on as a sign that it all came from the Lord. But simultaneously, that was the financial support for the priests, the, the full-time temple ministers, 
if you like. So Nehemiah and co. were saying, we will value God's temple enough to put its financial support first. And the end of verse 39, at the end of our passage this morning, sums that up. We will not neglect the house of our God. So why was the temple so important? The answer is because in Old Testament times, it was absolutely central to relating to God. Because God had said sinful people could only relate to him if he forgave them on the basis of sacrifice. And the temple was where priests made sacrifice as the means of that happening. Whereas for us today, everything that happened in the temple has been fulfilled in Jesus. So his sin-bearing sacrifice on the cross was what all those other sacrifices pointed forward to. His ministry of forgiveness from heaven today was what all of those priests had pointed forward to. And so for us, the temple has been replaced by Jesus. Which is why as Christians, we bring no sacrifices like that. That's not what communion is about. We have no priests. I'm not a priest. Please don't call me one. We have no temples or holy places. This is not the house of the Lord. This is just a Victorian rain shelter. So in Old Testament times, if you ask the question, you know, how can I find God and relationship with God? The answer was go to the temple. Whereas in New Testament times, if you ask the same question, the answer is go to Jesus. And if you then ask, but where do I find Jesus? The answer is in the Bible. And if you then ask, but where is the Bible being opened? Where can I find that? And find people who already know Jesus who will help me to understand it. The answer is church local church and that's why every faithful local church is so important as important now as the temple was then and that's why for us this third commitment translates as we will value God's church enough to put its financial support first where church doesn't mean the building it means us and our ministry and our witness together and if you want help with first steps or next steps in giving financially to God's work here and overseas, you can try the, the Give Joyfully giving point at the back or the giving section of our website. So that's it. That's the life we are forgiven for. It's the kind of life where we will only seek marriages which encourage us to put the Lord first. And that is costly in a world that says, why don't you settle for less? Have the relationship you deserve. It's the kind of life where we will live as people who belong to the Lord first, which is costly in a world that belongs first to money and earning it and spending it. And it's the kind of life where we'll value God's church enough to put its financial support first, which is costly in a world that says, it's yours, spend it on yourself. But the Christian life is costly, isn't it? Because we are not forgiven in order to put Jesus somewhere in our lives. We are forgiven in order to put Jesus first. So let's use this final song to tell him that is what we want to do. Be thou my vision, thou and thou only, first in my heart. Let's stand and sing.